survivor. The nothing personal word of the day is survivor, as in the reality show, as in the show I was on. I wanted to talk to you because survivor, as it turns out, is one of the things that is most often asked when people meet me, whether I'm giving a speech or I meet people on the street or in a restaurant or people come up to me to talk to me. Sometimes they talk baseball, no doubt about it. Sometimes nothing personal. But very often the question is, you were on Survivor. You're that guy from Survivor. Yes, I am that guy. The story of Survivor for me is one of the great stories of sticking to it, having high expectations, over-promising, under-delivering, and never regretting a single thing. Survivor started in 2000. I was with the Montreal Expos, and our home games were played in Canada at Olympic Stadium. It premiered on a Thursday night back in 2000. It was a mid-season replacement. And the interesting thing is that I was working with an assistant GM named Larry Beinfest, who would end up being our GM and then president of baseball operations and for the World Series winning Marlins in 03. And he had been with the Mariners and Jim Beatty had hired him to come to Montreal because he needed an assistant general manager. So we both saw the Survivor was debuting and we were very interested in the show because at the time, there were not a lot of reality TV shows. I certainly wasn't watching any reality unscripted TV shows. And this looked fascinating to me, putting a group of 18 or 20 people together and literally having them survive, which is the opposite of anything I'd ever done. I grew up in New York City. I didn't know how to make fire. I didn't know how to be hungry. I knew how to be grumpy. I didn't know how to do anything other than get my way. I didn't know how to compromise. I didn't know how to be quiet. I didn't know how to really do anything other than in the business world. So I was fascinated with the social experiment. But of course, we couldn't watch Survivor ever live because every night in baseball, there are baseball games. So Thursday night, I guess there'd be an occasional off day, but mostly we'd be at Olympic Stadium and we would have our video guy back then. They would video and do, it was not like today where every player has a tablet, every player has a phone. You can get real-time video of every pitcher, every pitch, every at-bat. We would actually record games on a VCR tape and then people would have stations, players would have stations where they could pause, fast forward, rewind, but it was very sort of cumbersome. And we asked to please have, there was no DVR, of course, please tape the Survivor premiere, and then we would watch it. And we would bring it up to the suite after a game and after we'd been in the clubhouse and after we had bemoaned the latest loss or celebrated the latest win, sent out the latest player, called up the newest player, we'd go back into the suite and we would watch Survivor on tape. And we would do this every Thursday night. And Larry and I would talk often, God, we'd love to be on that show. Except Larry said, I would never want to because I get all these bug bites and I would just get destroyed. It looks miserable. And he'd say, I'm too hungry. I would never do it. But I always wanted to do it. But it was just a pipe dream. Never really thought twice about it. And the years would pass. I watched every single season. I didn't miss a season. I didn't miss an episode. The technology got better where eventually you're able to DVR it. We eventually had discs before DVR. We had compact discs, which is something no one's ever heard of anymore. But we always would watch Survivor. We'd watch the finale. We'd always dream about going to the finale. One day, Larry and I were together in Florida, and I said, you know what? I'm doing it. I want to apply to be on Survivor. Because at the end of every season, they would always say, Jeff Probst, the host, would say, if you think you have what it takes to be the sole survivor, go to cbs.com and send in a video. So what did I do? I sent in a video. I had the hardest time recording it because it had to be two minutes. He had to upload it to a website. I didn't really understand how to do it. It took me forever. But I figured out a way, and I sent in a video. It was a horrible application video. The next day, I got a phone call from an unknown number. And the only reason I ever answered unknown numbers is that usually it was our owner, Jeffrey Loria, who would call with unknown number. Other than that, I would try not to answer. So I took the call and it was someone from casting 
that we would have the ability to talk about potentially being on the show. So what I did was I said, hello, yes, this is KR from Survivor and I have your video. Are you really serious that you would be on the show? And I said, um, yes, I, I'd very much like to be on the show. And he said, you're the president of the Miami Marlins. You can't leave in the middle of your season. I said, listen, if I am cast on this show, I will find a way to leave during the season. When is it filmed? And he said, well, it's filmed during the summer of 2013 is the season that they're casting for. And so I said, well, I bet I could do it. And he said, listen, you're going to need a letter from your owner saying that you are allowed to leave the baseball season in the middle of the show. I had not yet told my owner that I wanted to be on Survivor. I certainly had not told him I needed to be away if I'm going to do it for at least 39 days, but likely closer to 50 days in the middle of the season. So the conversation with the Survivor casting agent just stopped because he said, if you ever get a letter, send it in and then we'll talk maybe. So I called up Jeffrey and I said, I want to be on Survivor. And he said, no. And I said, could you just send a letter saying that I could be on Survivor? You know, I'm never going to get cast. There's no chance. There's like 300,000 people who submit videos and they only choose 18. What are the chances? He said, David, they're definitely going to want you on. You know that. I said, Jeffrey, I appreciate that, but I'm not sure that I fit the bill. I'm not exactly a typical survivor in any way, shape, or form. I'm on the old side. I'm inexperienced. I'm not all that interesting, and I really don't know how to open a coconut. I don't know how to build a shelter. I don't know how to make fire. Jeffrey said, fine, I'll give you the letter. Writes a letter. I take the letter, I send it in, and I send an email saying, I have a letter, can we talk? So the casting people call me back and say, all right, you have the letter. We would like you to come to Los Angeles where you will have to spend five days and you will go through psychological testing, you'll go through physical testing. Because of your age, you're gonna have to have a special physical with an EKG, with a prostate exam, the whole package. And I said, I'm in. So I had spoken to my family and they were not all that excited because I was away so often. I assured them that I didn't think I had any opportunity to actually make it onto the show. They thought, of course I would be cast. I said, I don't think I will be, but I'm gonna keep going. So I knew I had to fly to LA in order to go to a, what they called a finale of casting, where you go to a hotel, you sit for five days, and you have your phone, which was important, but you sit in a room in an airport hotel and you have no idea what's happening. All you know is that you're flying to LA. So they send you a ticket, which of course I have to admit here, I've never actually admitted this. They sent me a coach ticket. I didn't use their ticket and I reserved a first class ticket for myself. I'm not embarrassed to tell you that, but I had miles, I did it. So I get to LA. You get picked up by someone who doesn't tell you their name. They never call you by your name. I was DS. So I get into a car. They bring me to a hotel. They bring me into a room and they say, this is your room. Listen to your phone. Don't ever leave your room because when we call, you better answer. And we're watching. Now, I didn't think they meant they were watching me in my room, but I figured there were cameras in the hallway. So I'm sitting there and I get a call. DS, please go to the third floor. So I go out of the room and I go to the third floor and I walk into a room and I'm met by someone who says, okay, you're now gonna take an IQ test. So I walk into a room and there's about 15 to 25 other people who are already seated. I sit down next to a girl with a seat in between. By the way, spoiler alert, the girl turned out to be Sarah Lucina. The same Sarah Lucina who I ended up on Survivor Lift with, the same Sarah Lucina who I ended up running around the world with, the same Sarah Lucina who is a close dear friend of mine. I sit down next to her. To my right is a guy who turns out to be Spencer Bledsoe, who also was on our season. And there were all sorts of various other people. Take an IQ test, 
put it down, and they say, okay, go back to your room. Go back to your room, phone rings. You may now go eat. You go down to the hotel cafe, they sit you at a table alone. You are not allowed to talk to anyone. You look around and you see people who are just there staying at an airport hotel and you see people who are there who may be actually trying out for Survivor, but you don't know, you haven't seen anyone. Go back to the room, phone rings. You may now go to the gym, you have one hour. So you put on your gym clothes, you go to the gym and I go running. I was on a treadmill next to Sarah Lucina. And I was pretending that I could run faster. I was a runner at the time. I'm still a runner, but I'm not a very fast runner, but I was trying to show off. And it turns out that people had already been playing the game and I didn't know it. Sarah Lucina told me later that she noticed my Iron Man tattoo, so immediately knew that I must have been some sort of athlete. I, irony of ironies, right? I did the Iron Man in 15 hours. Not exactly a world-class athlete. So then you go back to the room, they call you up, you have 30 minutes, you may sit by the pool. So I would go to the pool, I'd swim a little bit because I figured if I'm on Survivor, I'm gonna have to know how to swim, even though I knew how to swim. So you'd get in the water, back to your room. Phone rings, come downstairs. I go downstairs, they have you see a doctor, a psychologist. So I tell them about all my mommy problems, I tell them about my daddy problems, I tell them that I wanna be on Survivor, here's why back upstairs. Next, come downstairs. There's Jeff Probst and Mark Burnett. I'm, stand, I'm sitting there in a room. There's the head of casting. Her name was Lynn Spillman. Jeff Probst, Mark Burnett. Jeff Probst looks at me and he says, you really want to do this game? I said, yes, very much. Why? You're the president of a major league baseball team. Why would you want to go on Survivor? And I said, this is the fastest way that I can make a million dollars. It will only take me 39 days. That's more than I get paid. This is a business transaction for me. And I know that I can win this game. Mark Burnett looked at me and he said, you're not gonna win this game. And I said, I think I can win this game and I will win this game. I didn't know what they wanted me to say. Do they want me to be humble, not humble? Yada, yada, yada. Go back up to the room, get a call. Please go downstairs to room G on the third floor. Go downstairs. There's a doctor like the guy from Minority Report who replaced Tom Cruise's eyes. The doctor says, all right, DS, you are about to get the following 10 shots. I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I didn't know whether I was cast. I didn't know anything. He gives me 10 shots, one hurts more than the next. I'm thinking this could be a good sign. I had no idea where it was being filmed because they used to switch locations all the time. Now they're in Fiji. But I figured, you know what? It's possible that we're gonna be in a crazy jungle. So I'm getting all these malaria shots, this and that. Go upstairs, get a phone call. Okay, you may now leave. All right, no idea what's going on. I leave, no news. I eventually get a call a few weeks later that they would like to cast me in Survivor. I will be part of the first season, season number 27, that will be filming in March and April of 2013. They give me a list of things I need to go buy, and I, they say, please go buy a blazer, go buy a shirt, it's gotta be solid, buy a pair of khaki pants and a pair of comfortable shoes, have a pair of water shoes, send us a picture of what you have, thank you very much. All right, I go shopping, they don't like what I buy, I then send new stuff, they don't like what I buy, I'm driving myself insane. Finally, I do a pictures while I'm at like a, a JC Penny buying shirts, buying shoes, I then get a call, well, we have some news for you. And I said, what, Are, am I off the show? Am I on the show, what's happening? Well, you're no longer in season 27, you're now gonna be in season 28, which means you're not starting till the beginning of July. So I'm sorry you got all excited to start in March, stay tuned, we'll call you again. Nothing. Then all of a sudden I start getting emails in June and I get a date and a plane ticket which of course I traded in and flew myself to LA. The rule is that you fly to LA and then you don't know anything. 
So I pack a bag. They have you put your stuff in bags because you have jury bags. Then you've got Ponderosa bags, which is when you're eliminated. You've got pregame bags. And all you know is that you're gone and you're not allowed to tell anybody where you're going. So I had a staff meeting with all my vice presidents and I said, I'm taking a leave of absence from the Marlins. People were shocked. My head of sales, my head of PR, nobody knew except for my wife and kids and Jeffrey, the owner, that's it. So I disappear. They don't know why. People thought that I was going to rehab actually, it turns out. I get on the plane, I get to LA. I go to my room, I had packed secretly sleeping pills. I had packed an eye touch because you're not allowed to have a phone, but I wanted music. I packed two cell phones. I hid them in different places because I thought that once I was eliminated from the game, I'd had then have access because I knew we had a trade deadline coming up and we were looking at trading Ricky Nolasco likely. I just wanted to be in touch with family, friends, etc. So they check me into a room, they bring me upstairs, they say, wait for further instructions. By the way, we will now be doing a full search of you and your stuff. I said, what, what do you mean? They said, well, there are people who have gone on the island with matches, with lighters, with phones. We do now full searches in LA, so here we go. They put on gloves. My God, they found it all and I was mortified. I thought they weren't gonna let me compete. They found Ambien, they found Xanax, they found Tylenol PM, they found phones, they found everything, batteries, everything you're not allowed to have. They look at me, they confiscate it all, and they said, await further instructions. I get a call. You may now go down and eat dinner. I went down, I had dinner, I don't see anybody. Go back upstairs. Get a phone call. Be in the lobby at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. I go in the lobby and they say, have your suitcase. I said, my God, this is it. We're flying somewhere. We don't know where we're flying. We don't know anything. They sit me in a place in the lobby where I'm completely alone. I don't see anyone else in the cast. I don't know what's going on. I'm sitting there. It's five minutes. It's 10 minutes. It's 15 minutes. It's 20 minutes. It's a half hour. It's 45 minutes that I'm sitting there and no one is talking to me. I don't know what to do. I'm told not to move. But eventually, I'm like, did they forget about me? Is this part of Survivor? Are they testing me? I go to the front desk and I say, this is the craziest thing I've ever said to anybody. But I'm here with people from CBS and... Do you know anything about CBS? Because I don't want to say I'm in Survivor. I'm not allowed to tell anyone. And they said, are you with the group who was heading to the airport? I said, I think so. They said, sir, they all left a half hour ago. I said, what? They said, I'm very sorry. I look around the lobby. There's no one there. No one who looked familiar to me, no one from casting, no other who could have been other cast members. I have no idea what to do. I thought I'd been eliminated from Survivor before the game even started. I thought I was being filmed. So I'm sitting there and I'm sweating. I don't know what to do. I know I'm about to fly somewhere. I don't know where. All of a sudden, someone comes running into the lobby and it's someone who I hadn't seen who was from Survivor casting who said, oh my God, DS, we are so sorry. They forgot me. They did a count of cast members before they left for the airport in a bus and they forgot me. So I got in a separate taxi. I got to the airport. Everybody was checked in. Everybody was there waiting. Everybody was in a line silently because the rules are no talking. They stared at me while I checked in. I got seat 84F and I saw that we were flying to Manila. Get on the plane. Here's the rules, no talking. You may not talk to anyone on the plane. And this is a 12 hour plane ride. Fly from Manila, but I see other cast members. So now I know what I'm dealing with. And I noticed that Cliff Robinson, the NBA player, is on the plane with me and is in the cast with me. And I said, wow, this is really cool. I wonder if there's an athletic theme to this season. Maybe it's players against front office, though I didn't recognize anybody else because I was trying to guess what the theme was. 
get on the flight. I try to stay as quiet as I can. I do laps on the plane. I can't sleep. They had taken away any sort of sleeping pills, so I had no ability to fall asleep at all. We land. We then connect to another plane going to a place called Luzon in northern Philippines. We land after another two hours. We get into a bus that is pitch black. They had blackened the windows, silent. Everyone's exhausted. We then get to a hotel. We are then introduced and we are told, you will now be quiet for the next number of days. We will tell you what you can do. Here are the tents that you're each gonna live in as you adjust to living in the outdoors and await further instructions. It's a thousand degrees, no air conditioning, and I've got a tent and I notice that Sarah Lucina is in the cast. So my tent is next to Sarah's coincidentally. For the next five days, we got tested physically, we got tested mentally. We got shown how to build shelter, we got shown how to make a fire, even though I couldn't do any of those things on the show. We did interviews with media, we did a cast photo, we did all of this preparation, but basically the 20 hours a day we were just sitting around doing nothing. All of a sudden, at two in the morning, we get a basically knock on the tent, Please come to the main part of Ponderosa. Get dressed. The game is going to start. People are running around. They're getting dressed. Everyone's all excited. We all had costumes to put on. I had my jacket. I had my khakis. We end up going and they split us up. We don't know our tribes. We don't know anything. All of a sudden, they start dismissing certain people at a time. And I'm noticing that I'm in a blue blazer, but I'm left in a room with a bunch of people wearing green. And I thought it was very interesting. I didn't know what it meant. We didn't have buffs. We didn't have anything. So six people disappear. Then six more people disappear. There's six of us left. I really have no idea who the six people are. I had seen them for the last five days, but didn't know their names, didn't know the theme of the season didn't know anything. All of a sudden, we're escorted out of the hotel. We're put on a bus. We're not told anything, just the six of us. And then we get out of the bus and there's a helicopter. What a dream come true. We were getting on a helicopter to start the game. So they explained to us how it was going to work. They were going to have a camera person in the helicopter. Then the camera person would get out of the helicopter. Then they'd film us in the helicopter. Then the helicopter would land. And that's all they said. They said, basically, good luck. I didn't know what to do. I thought for sure that I could win this game, but I was already hungry. I was already tired. I was already grumpy. I didn't know anyone on my tribe. I didn't know the theme of the season. We get to the start of the game. They stand you on a platform, six, six, and six. Cameras everywhere. Crew members everywhere. The next thing I know, out comes Jeff Probst, who we hadn't seen the entire pregame. He comes out and he looks around, the cameras roll, and he says, welcome to Survivor 28, Survivor Cagayan. And we're all cheering. We're all excited. We think it's the greatest thing ever. The game has started. I'm all excited. I'm ready. It's 39 days in front of me. I'm thinking there's a chance to win. Everything's all set. And before you know it, he then says, what does it take to win Survivor? And he goes into it, takes brains, beauty, brawn, which is the best thing to have. I'm looking around. I see Cliff Robinson. I see Tony Vlacos. I see Sarah Lucina, not with me. I see Morgan McLeod. I see Jeffra Blinds, not with me. I'm looking, I'm saying, oh, oh my God. I'm in the brains tribe, aren't I? Jeff then introduces each tribe. He calls on someone pretending not to know our names, but of course he knows our names. And he asks, so which tribe do you think you are? Which tribe do you think you are? Which tribe do you think you are? And I'm saying, I think we're the brains. He then asks, okay, guys, pick a team leader. My brains tribe looks around 
and I have no choice. I'm dressed like Thurston Howell from Gilligan's Island in a blazer. They look at me and say, you be the leader. Why don't you be the leader? And I didn't want to be the leader because that's the first rule of Survivor. When you're the leader, you're totally screwed. But what was I going to do? They had looked at me unanimously and said, you just be the leader. And so I was. And I knew that minute that I was part of the Brains Tribe, the oldest member, wearing a blazer and khakis and loafers. They had just voted me as the leader. And I said to myself, oh my God, I have to avoid being the first one voted off. That's the only thing I care about. I cannot be the first person voted off. Was I? You bet your ass I was. I want to bring in some people to talk about this because I'm not over it. And I think it would be very interesting as part of Nothing Personal to explain how personal Survivor actually is when I was treating it like a business. But these people weren't. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You will not believe who has joined me. We have a full reunion of the original Brains Tribe from Survivor 28 Cagayan. We've got Garrett, we've got Spencer, we've got Tasha, we've got Cass, we've got Jatia. This was the group. We were together on a helicopter. We were sizing each other up. And a story that I've never told anyone is that I didn't like Garrett from the beginning for the most bizarre reason ever. Because Garrett, when we got to the airport in Los Angeles, waiting to board a plane to Manila, Garrett had this big, huge amount of food that he was eating. And I wondered why he was doing that. I forgot and about that. Remember, do you remember that, Spencer? It was a vat of food. Then we got to pregame. And Garrett was always the first person online at the buffet, <laughs> breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He went back for seconds, thirds, fourths, and he had, he had the best body. He had like a 12-pack. I was like, who is this guy? So that was me with Garrett. And then Jatia, if you guys remember this, Jatia in a non-air-conditioned pregame room where we sat all day, this woman who I didn't know was hogging the fan the entire time. <laughs> She literally sat there covering the fan. So the rest of us were schwitzing and she didn't care at all. So at all. it was the group. And all of a sudden we were named the Brain Tribe. I wanna start with you, Garrett. When you saw that you were on the Brain Tribe, what was your first reaction of us? Well, I was certainly very unhappy to be part of the Brain Tribe uh, before I even met any of you. Obviously the brains, indicated I think more than beauty or brawn uh, a level of sort of survivor skill that that I suspected the other tribes probably would be lacking uh, and I certainly was not wrong there everyone came out playing very hard right out the gate and my master plan to utilize every every person as a chess piece uh, failed almost immediately uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah so when you guys asked me to be the leader and you needed, we then needed to choose someone to eliminate right there at the beginning of the game. Who is it that you all thought that I would choose? And were you all surprised that I immediately went with Garrett? Yeah. I thought you were going to choose Spencer. <laughs> what? Why? I, I don't know, because you look like the nerdiest. And I, I, I don't know, you, I, I guess stereotypically nerdiest or something. So I, I, I had no idea. But I, I was surprised that you chose Garrett. But Shatia, you actually wore a shirt that said you were a nerd. Well, that's the shirt they told me to wear. But um, <laughs> it's the shirt they picked. Um, but honestly, it was kind of funny because when they were going to choose the leader, I was like, look at the floor, look at the floor, don't be the leader. So I'm like, oh, I'm good. I wasn't the leader. And it's kind of funny because, you know, I, you know, was bossy in another way. But that was like my don't be bossy <laughs> move by not being picked as the leader. So. I was happy for you to do it, David. Thanks for stepping up there, bud. So Cass, as, as the older woman on the tribe and in Survivor, sometimes being the older person, man or woman, is an issue. When they called me as the leader and I had to choose someone, were you thinking it was going to be you? Oh, yeah. I thought for sure it was going to be me. Um, and I thought either you or Garrett uh, would be the alpha male leaders. So I didn't have a problem with that. Uh, and, but I was fully expecting to be the one to have to go. 
So as happened to Trish, right? They picked the older woman. Yeah, yeah. Although I kind of felt like Jatia would have been the pick because of her fan hogging ways um, pregame. <laughs> I was like, like I, I would send like Jatia because not monopolizing she needs a height. Should have, you know, like y'all should have been in the fan. Like you literally like <laughs> laid on that sofa, pulled that fan over, and just lay, sat there while Garrett was eating hard boiled eggs nonstop. <laughs> oh, I had a, I, I put up a whole relaxation zone and I was like, I don't understand why people aren't doing it. So I remember Garrett's bowl would just be like mounded with hard boiled eggs and he'd sit there and I'd watch him and I was like, oh, wow. He's Spencer was that. eating pretty well too, though. Like I remember, like I was like, that yeah. boy's gonna throw up. He's gonna puke if he I goes back one up. more time. Or the night before the season started, I was like throwing up uh, all night, and it was just me and LJ there. Everyone else was getting a good night's sleep, and I was freaking out. <laughs> Spencer, during the pregame, <laughs> did you notice the things that we're just talking about during the pregame? Some, I mean, Garrett, yes. Jatia, no. I, I had no idea about the fan gate. I only heard later that people were like trying to get the fan and Jatia would swipe it back from them. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, I have to say this. Um, for my casting, Jatia was there and Lynn told us that there was one spot left. So I thought I was competing against Jatia. We were like the final two. So I was shocked to see her in LA before we flew out because we thought there was one spot left. They, they did, they told us they needed, um, we came in pretty late and they told us they were looking like for, there was a group of black girls and there was a group of Asian girls. Cause I guess somebody dropped out and yeah. it was three, it was three black girls, me, Tosh and another girl. And it's yeah. funny because they asked us, yeah. And they asked us about it. And I remember talking about the other black girl and I was like, oh, she looked like a deer in the headlights. I was like, but that other black girl, she looked like, yeah, she's ready. And I remember <laughs> I said positive things about you. So I was already like, I was like, yeah. So it was very interesting that they cast me and Tasha because I guess we yeah. were both strong. So we kind of had a little bit of a connection before we stepped foot on the beach. Yep. True story. So were you both excited that you were part of the same tribe, Tasha and Jatia, because you thought you had an alliance already? Yes, I'm not gonna lie. I was like, I got a connection. I didn't think we had an alliance, but I was like, I got a connection. At least I know her. I think yeah, I was glad to see someone, you know, that I had seen in the process because we didn't get to go through like the full process like everyone else did. So it was good to kind of just have that familiarity. Yeah, so that was a good starting point. I felt similarly about Cass. I felt like we had a connection going through casting together, sitting on the bus. I thought you were the nice mom. <laughs> 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 yeah, I know yeah. I, re I remember David and Spencer from casting. Uh, so do you know that it was me, you cast Spencer, Sarah Lucina, Wu, who was on our season, Tony, we wow. were all at finals the same time. More than just that too. And Trish. LJ, uh, Trish, LJ. I, yeah. Um, it was like nine of the 18. Amazing, because I took the IQ test sitting next to Sarah and sitting across the aisle from you, Spencer. And I remember that you were in white tube socks and slides <laughs> and sweatpants. And I thought, this guy is no problem. <laughs> no funny. problem. <laughs> okay, so fast forward. So they, I choose Garrett as the person to eliminate, find out that Garrett's not being eliminated, but Garrett gets an advantage that he gets to go to the island first. Garrett, when did you realize that A, you were gonna get an idol, and B, that you were gonna lie about the idol? How quickly into the game did you make that decision? Well, you know, it's funny, it was like probably one second for both things, but it's like, you have all of these plans in your head and then, execution in real time is, is a much different animal, you know? And so the decision was made and in my own head, I had this brilliant sort of plan, but of course I'm playing with, with a bunch of very intelligent players. And so I think uh, it was very obvious to, I think many people on the tribe, if not everyone that, you know, I did have an idol and I didn't do a particularly good job of hiding it. Probably just like I didn't do a, you know, a particularly good job of, of hiding my profession, saying I'm a personal trainer and, and this and that. So, so I guess the lesson here is sort of, uh, you know, I had certain plans, but, but if you don't execute them well, like it, it's all a disaster. And that, I totally kind of believe the personal trainer thing. You sold that right. one. That yeah, was, that was, yeah. 
I thought Thank you were you. a doctor. I thought you were someone like in LA. You know, I agree. Covered. All right, all right, I'll take it. And then the other thing with food is everyone of their mother over the years has criticized like, how dumb is this Garrett guy? He must have obviously been dieting before, but clearly I wasn't. <laughs> like, I was eating everything I could eat to try and stock up like a bit on, on stores. But at that time in my life, I, I think everything just went right through me. I was just so into fitness and whatnot. So. Why is it that any of you believed that on the Brains Tribe, and, and I'm not trying to make an issue of this because I'm sure there are intelligent personal trainers out there, but did you, anybody actually believe that Garrett was a personal trainer when he yeah. said it? Most of yes. us do yeah. because yeah. Like, <laughs> the Survivor all the time casts a theme where it doesn't make sense. They cast Game Changers and then they have yeah. the windows on Game Changers, right? So it's not weird to have someone who doesn't totally fit the theme. Plus, there's really smart trainers out there. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's, you, it can't define you just because you're physically fit and into fitness that you're not a Brains Tribe member. I mean, and he was the epitome of fitness. I remember yeah. him telling me it took three hours to wax his whole body. <laughs> so, and I was just like... And it, and it showed. I mean, the body looked good. So, yes, yeah. if that's your, if that's your uh, product, then business was, you know, boom. So, yeah, I mean, I thought he was a very successful trainer. So. Yeah. So, take right, guys, I'll take it that. Does. I'll take whatever kind of compliments I can get after <laughs> my train wreck. That might be all you get. <laughs> no, so the thing that really, like, did not sit was when you were trying to show us this waterfall and you couldn't find it, I was like, oh, True. that's bull****. That yeah, was what yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. The waterfall. <laughs> yeah. So here's the story for, for people listening to the show. When you, we got to the island, we all had come from the beginning of the show and Garrett had a head start. We walk onto the beach. We're all fully clothed. Garrett is down to his skivvies already. And he's got some cuts on his body. He's got his 12 pack going. And he said, we said, hey, what have you been doing? And we introduced ourselves and because we didn't know each other's names. We had seen each other for five days before and in some cases for months before, but we didn't know each other's names. Hey, what have you been doing? He said, oh man, I've been exploring the island and I tripped and I fell. There's this amazing waterfall. I think we should all go there. And we were like, what? Like, why would we do that? But we followed him. But then, do you remember, we sort of gave up mm -hmm. and we tried to build a shelter. And so it's true in Survivor. And we were all new players. There's no shelter. There's no food. There are coconuts without coconut trees. There are bamboo um, sticks without bamboo trees. And there are these palm leaves without palm fronds. But that's for another day. So we're trying to build a shelter. And we're supposed to be the Brains Tribe. So, Jatia, what made you decide that you were going to take charge of that? So, right. Um, there was no f reason, right? Like, this is the thing. Everybody was, like, standing around looking at themselves, right? Nobody, I just want to say this, nobody would say anything, right? So, this was, like, choosing a leader all over again, right? And so I'm like, okay, well, I didn't step up to be the leader and pick somebody. So maybe I'll do this. I have no, f I hate f building stuff. Sorry, let me say that. I don't like building anything. I don't know why, but I was like, okay, if somebody doesn't say anything, we're going to be sitting on the ground. Had I known what I know knew now and maybe knew people a little bit better, I'd have been like, Cass, girl, build us a fence like you do on the farm. And, w and I would have shut up, but no idea. No idea. Why did I step up? Shut up. That's what I should have done. <laughs> So I thought that you, Jatia, were not really the best leader in terms of bossing us around and the shelter was a disaster. And I Absolutely. had started befriending Cass because we were wondering what it is that you were trying to accomplish because I, we wanted a nice shelter and we were supposed to be the Brains Tribe. And the, the, if, if I had to ask you, looking back, let, let me ask you this, Spencer, actually, what is the least brainy thing that we did, in your opinion, in the first two days? Oh man, the least brainy thing we did? Looking back, knowing what you know now, what's the biggest mistake we made in the first two days? What are you doing, Jatia? Um, not drinking the water. Oh, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I that totally was agree. by far the worst thing we did because I was damn delirious. Yeah, uh, that's so true. We were just like, our first challenge, we went in and we were all, I think, just felt like we were going to die because we hadn't had. Yeah. We were waiting to be able to boil it. We, little did we know it's just water that like bottled water probably that they pour in this. <laughs> um, Not probably. So here, let's give people a little behind the scenes. You're told before the game starts, 
boil your water. That's how you can make rice and that's what you can use to drink. And we're a bunch of smart people. We said, I guess that sort of makes sense. We should boil water before we drink it. They show you a well of water. There was a full well there and we did not drink a drop of water in the first two days of the game. And it was, and we were trying to build a shelter. We weren't sleeping. The only food was coconuts Mm -hmm. and we were rationing the coconuts. As you recall, we were doing math equations because we thought those were all the coconuts we would have. And we thought that we better not drink them a lot. So we had no food, no coconuts, no nothing. Garrett's lying around, right? Because he's (laughs) such a big guy. Anyone else remember Garrett lying around for like hours at a time? On the palm frond. He used to have me get his water bottle for him that was hanging on the tree above him. He'd be like, Cass. I I will have to say in my defense, the first 24, 48 hours, I was such a workhorse, right? Like I I was doing everything I could. You worked hard building the shelter for sure. And I think- But then, but yeah, after after a day or two, physically, mentally, and emotionally, like I fell apart like in almost every way quickly. Uh, Again, I think, I was so used to eating so many calories to go from that to very close to zero. I just shut down like in every way almost immediately, you know? So it wasn't for a lack of, of effort. I meant like I did almost everything wrong, but I would have kept doing if I could. I just like had nothing in the tank almost immediately. Wait, but I will say Garrett on the water challenge, you were yeah. a beast. Like yeah. you killed it. Well, thank you. Yeah, I don't even know where I don't even know where I found that energy. Like I had, not, you know, that was six days later. But so, yeah, so you skipped uh, ahead, Tasha, because I never I got say. to do a water challenge. Oh, sorry, David. <laughs> so let's now go to the challenge. We're spo- the way it works is you get a note and you hear from producers that you're going to have to go to a challenge. You go silently to the challenge. You see a doctor, and we were a disaster because I can't even we were. Believe we were they let us go on in that challenge. Like, honestly, I can't even believe they let us do the challenge. I was lightheaded on the dock, I was trying to like stumble. Like, I, I was, we were all, I think, like extremely weak. Spencer, yeah. do you remember what you said to the doctor? Because we were supposed to be silent, but Spencer, you said to the doctor that you did not think it was safe for us to do the challenge because we had not had any water of any kind. I did? Yes, you did. And what they said is... I don't remember. I don't remember. Oh, I remember this like it was yesterday because it was the only challenge I ever did on Survivor. The response was, you will get through this challenge do me a favor when you get back to camp, convince the rest of your tribe that it's okay to drink the water. Mm. See, so I have a problem with that because it shouldn't be Spencer convincing the rest of the tribe. They should tell us, drink the water. Your, your, your health and safety is important. For sure, for sure. I don't think it was, like, I, I didn't know for sure it was fine to drink. I think it might have been Garrett who was supposed to convince the tribe. I think you guys, you remember we used to go to the medical tent like two at a time. So clearly whoever was with David, they were talking. And I remember after that challenge, David was like, hey, you guys, I think we should just drink the water. And I remember being like, you a medical doctor, David? Because I don't know, you know, I remember like pushing back because the medical doctor told us to boil the water. And I think that was a bit irresponsible, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, yeah, I remember. I remember asking the doctor at the challenge, can we just drink that water? Because it, to me, it kind of smelled like Campton tablets, which are when you're backpacking, what you put in the water yeah. to clarify it. And, but I didn't want to get a parasite because I knew a lot of people had gotten parasites. And she said, you can drink the water. She's like, you're supposed to boil it, but you should drink it. And I remember going to the well and just drinking it right after that challenge. We all kind of did that, didn't we? Yeah. yeah, I went with you, Cass, to the, I went with you to water and we had the water and that's when we talked about Jatia and I thought we had an alliance and now let's get to the, the, the vote. It was me, you and Spencer 
So there were three of us out of six. I'm not exactly sure how I did my math. I didn't talk to Tasha, which I should have. And I didn't talk to Garrett because I wanted Garrett out of the game. Garrett, I didn't realize, wanted me out of the game. I thought it was the easiest vote ever, five to one against Shatia because she had been bossy. And I said, let's get through this one vote and then we'll worry about trying to win a challenge and figure out what's next. So I was so confident going into final tribal. Can I just ask, because I've never had a chance to ask you guys since that day, including any moment in the six years since, at what point did Garrett start going against me when you guys knew that you were about to blindside me? Can you please tell me the story? So as soon as we got on the island, me, uh, Garrett, Spencer, and Tasha had a foursome. And you and Cass were going. Yeah. And that was like Minutes. literally like five minutes after we got on, before we went searching for the waterfowl. And then when we were in the challenge, yes, I was bossy. Yes, the shelter was a hot mess. Um, but, and then Cass was already, she was already outside the Alliance. And so she was telling me that, you know, they didn't want me around. So it was kind of fitting the narrative anyway. So like I, you know, pretended to cry and blah, blah, blah. But I knew I was like, okay, well, let me work even harder on my Alliance. And then the other thing is like, when I tried to get to tribal council, I remember you like dropped the keys or something and something happened in the first show. Oh, the locks, something about the locks or something. And I was like, okay, and let me use that. So that was the thing. It was the alignment. And then you had like a little fumble, um, which, you know, admittedly wasn't as much as my being bossy in the shelter thing, but those were kind of the two things from my point of view. So Spencer, what about you? Because I thought you were with us. Yeah, I mean, I was like never saying no to any deals in, in the first days, but I made that four person alliance really early and I was thinking of that as like my group. And then, I mean, honestly, in retrospect, it obviously worked out terribly for almost all of us. So I probably did make a mistake. Like I kind of uh, was interested in playing with you and Cass, but uh, it didn't make sense. Like I wouldn't even be able to pull it off because we weren't even splitting the votes. So, yeah. And Cass, were you aware that, that I was being blindsided and not you or that we had not, didn't have Spencer? Or were you surprised at that tribal council? I was surprised at that tribal and I was super pissed because, um, you know, obviously when the only person you've talked to gets blindsided, you know you're next. But that just galvanized me. It actually, you're going out and me being blindsided by them just made me realize I was going to play this game alone and there was no way around it. And I was just going to have to get into that mode. So, and that's pretty much how I played my entire survivor career was, you know, kind of from, from the bottom. And it was a direct result from that first tribal. I knew those four were tight though. I mean, they slept in the shelter, the faulty shelter together. Um, I even approached Jatia and Tasha and said, can we do a girls thing? And they said, no, we're, we've already got an alliance. They both kind of shut me down quickly. Uh, Garrett and Spencer were open to it, but I don't know how sincere they were, you know. Um, oh, we were so I, was, I mean, we were trying to work with you. I yeah. was super blindsided, and to me, it didn't make sense. I felt there had been so many uh, issues with Jatia that logically, if we wanted to stay together as a tribe, we should get rid of, you know, the person causing the friction at that point. So I was still in this logic mode, and it snapped me right out of that. And so thank you for that, guys, because that really... <laughs> shaped the future of a uh, chaos cast as we came to know her. So get Garrett, could you just explain how it is that you, you now we know how you got me out because you were right. gunning for me from the beginning. How right. is it that you ended up the next one out then? Right. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I, to, to sort of your, you know, outs first, you know, it was, it was never personal. Uh, it was quite simply like, okay, this guy is unapologetically coming after me. And so I really only have one move. You know, like, so it was, it was always going to be you if I had any say over it as opposed to Cass, right? Because again, the other four of us were in the alliance. Um, but, you know, and I, I guess I will say there too, it's funny how first impressions can so often be wrong in life, you know, like on the island, like I legitimately didn't like you. Like, uh, you know, maybe I convinced myself of that to like, you know, feel fine about voting against you or whatever the case. And you know, That's almost immediately fun. after the game ended, you and I have been and continue to remain very close, you know. So I think there's, there's a lesson to be learned there. But as it relates to me, you know, going second, uh, again, I think 
we're, we're, we again see the difference between sort of the academic strategic way of, of going about this where, you know, once you're at five, you need to split up your four, pull in a third, and then the three of you are going to be rock solid, you know, until the, the tribe dissolves. Uh, that works on paper. In practice, it was obviously a disaster for me. And, you know, I think I'll get a bit deep here and, and, and just talk about at that point in my life, I think I lacked the emotional intelligence to recognize what the hell was really going on. Uh, and it's no one's fault but my own that I went home second. It was my responsibility to, uh, to be able to read Cass, to be able to connect with Cass, to have her truly want to work with us. And that obviously was not the case. And, and as such, like, obviously I went home second and, you know, I feel really shitty for my good friend Spencer here too, because as a result, you know, we have a, a great character, an excellent survivor player in Spencer who, you know, had to climb uphill the entire game. And, you know, if I would have simply executed better or recognized, okay, we don't have cast, the four of us should stay together. The four of us being me, Spencer, Jatia, and Tasha. Uh, all of those things, you know, could have possibly helped him win the game instead of having to, to climb. Because I certainly wasn't going to win the game at, at 26. I, I just didn't have what it took emotionally, socially, et cetera. Do you still have your idol, Garrett? I never, I never got that idol back. <laughs> they, they never gave me an idol after the game, you know. But Honestly, though, Garrett, I think it worked out as well as it possibly could have for me. I think if you had executed better, I could have been a cocky jerk. But because I had to fight from the bottom, I was an underdog. And that pretty much, like, created the Kageyan arc. Sure. I mean, just one more thing about Spencer real quick. I mean, it's uh, – I'm sure he's – you know, it, we've talked, and I know he's made peace with it. But, man, I still hurt for him. Like, just watching him play every day or almost every day, I forget, in, in both of his seasons. and. I thought he was just such an incredible player in both seasons, especially the season where Jeremy won. Like, we went to Final Tribal. I didn't get spoiled or anything before, and I watched it. And I'm just, like, looking at, at my now fiancé being like, he's got this. He's got this. And then, I mean, I, I still hurt to this day, you, you know, watching that. You know, I, I never was a survivor character. I played six days, whatever. But, but I, I still hurt for him because of all that. Oh, thanks, man. It's all good. It, it is. Uh, we have an interesting hi history, all six of us together, and it's nice. I'm very thankful that you all would come on. I think Survivor is interesting to me. It is quite the social experiment. They get people from all walks of life. Some people can't get past Survivor. I've come across people during the years since we filmed, cast members who literally can't move on from it, who can't come to grips with it. And listen, I live with it. I think about it, just so you know, and I've told the listeners this, I think about being first boot every day still. I think about it every day. Something comes up or something's in my mind that I think about every day about what I did wrong, why I did it wrong, and how I built this up. I always wanted to be on Survivor like we all did. And then it just ends. And for three of us, Jatia, Garrett, and myself, it ended way prematurely. You know, Tasha and Cass and Spencer, actually, the three of you had long, real Survivor careers. I mean, real, maybe three of the top 20 players of all time in Survivor, if I could say that. And uh, from that season, people look at our season. I don't know if you guys think about this. People look at Kageon as one of the best seasons of all time. Oh, for sure. It was. Oh, I think it was the awesome season. So I want to jump in here. I'm going to just boss my way on in here like I do. Um, <laughs> and say that um, I think all everybody in our tribe, we had our stories, you know, on our season. But I think... Everybody who gets cast on Survivor gets cast for a reason um, because we all have an interesting story and, and things to tell. And your game is your game. You know, it's what happens. A lot of it is luck. Let's be honest. So I want, I want people to know that, like, you can have the best laid plans and they can go to crap for whatever reason. Um, I think everybody's game is their game. I think we learn things about ourselves that helped us grow and evolve into the people that we are becoming. And I think we're all amazing people. Um, I think Spencer, I have enjoyed watching you grow and seeing you go back and seeing Tasha go back. And I've become friends with a lot of you guys, but I, I, I don't 
like feel any regrets. Like we are who we are and we played how we played. So um, I, I just want to put that out there. And I think that everybody's game was good. It's just everybody can't win. Somebody got to be voted out. You know, like I talked to David, I was ready to just tear into David's ass after some uh, publicity and after we got off. Cause uh, whatever, I don't know, you heard, you called me crazy town or something, whatever. And you know, I called you up and we was about to have a conversation and <laughs> we ended up having an amazing conversation and David's an amazing man. So Survivor is not us. And the cookie, you know, the crumbles how it crumbles. Um, and I think everybody played a good game, whether you got voted out first or whether you were asked back for another season, I think everybody played to the best of their abilities. Um, and honestly, if it all boils down to it, I want to give a shout out to everybody who went back. You represented amazing. Spencer, awesome. He's the yoga guru and, you know, it's getting everybody to that next plane with the things that he have, he's learned. And David is, you know, doing all his outreach in, in the sports world. Tasha is killing it with Chick-fil-A. Go girl, give me a chicken sandwich. I'll take a coupon. When I come to St. Louis, I'm definitely coming for a Chick-fil-A sandwich. Come, oh my come see me, come see me. <laughs> yes, and Cass doing her thing out in Texas, teaching the babies and, you know, raising a fantastic little girl, um, well, grown woman now. I saw the picture. She's like almost as tall as you. So I just want to say that I have really enjoyed it. I have no regrets. I think everybody did the best that they could with what they were giving. And I am happy to know you guys and to see you guys doing the awesome things that you're doing. Thank you, Jatia. That's a, that's a nice ending. Cass, give me some final words. We're going to go around. I want to hear from everyone, but Cass, tell me something. I got nothing for you, man. <laughs> oh, Cass, you never have nothing. Let's talk about you moved to Texas. You had a health issue, which I'm, I'm hoping you're feeling better. Your daughter is a major guitar player. Is that true? Uh, she's a bass player. Let's not confuse that. But <laughs> it's not a guitar. Uh, she slaps yeah. the bass. She is. She's learning some. She was just working on some Rick James and some ABBA. And she likes the funky stuff. So uh, she's definitely a little bass player. Uh, living in Texas, teaching at Texas Tech University. Uh, six days ago, I had a heart surgery. So I'm still getting over that. Uh, yeah. So I'm a little low energy today. Well, you look terrific, Cass. And I'm very glad that you're feeling better. Thanks. Tasha? Hey. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm just doing my thing with Chick-fil-A. Um, I think being on the island just helped me to prepare myself for the, the Chick-fil-A world, um, just being able to work with different people. And I agree with Jatia, like everybody's um, experience is different. Everybody comes on for different reasons, but the relationships you build, the things you learn, um, they kind of shape you and kind of help you move past the survival world. But I love my experience. I wouldn't change it. I love playing with you guys. I think we had one of the best seasons ever. Definitely one of the best tribes ever, even in the midst of the hot mess. <laughs> but I feel like um, Kagian kind of paved the way for Cass and myself to, to come back and, and do our thing. And just our season, Tony, like, we just had so many awesome players on our season and it was just an honor and yeah. Good. Thank you, good. Tasha. Can you have us all to your Chick-fil-A franchise? Yes. Do you want to? Yes. yes. Come see me. Chick-fil-A on me. <laughs> Chick-fil-A on you. Garrett, some final words. Yeah. You know, I kind of want to echo a bit of what you were saying, David, as well as, as Jatia, you know, I think, almost immediately after my season, I think uh, I didn't really come to terms with, with what happened. So I just like anyone that asked, I just played the too cool card and just go, I don't watch that show anymore. I don't care. Like it, it doesn't matter. You know? um, but the, the truth was it, it did matter. Uh, I, I didn't care about, you know, becoming famous. Uh, you know, the, the million dollars wasn't going to make her or, or break my life or something like that. But what it was for me at that time was it was a moment. It was an opportunity. Uh, and I think I, for many years, never forgave myself for, to be honest, just fucking up this opportunity. Uh, and, you know, I, I didn't watch the show for many seasons. And 
coincidentally, I watched, you know, this, this most recent season, was it 40, I guess? Uh, and I loved it again. I fell in love with Survivor again. And it, it allowed me the opportunity to, to finally forgive myself. You know, if I'm being totally honest, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of been, ha I've, I've had a golden spoon in my mouth sort of my whole life. Almost everything has kind of just worked out for me in life. And so I think to have this go terribly wrong uh, was very therapeutic and, and helpful for, for my development as a person, you know? And so, you know, I, as much as I don't want to admit it, I think I kind of fall in the same sort of fall in line with almost every other player who didn't win Survivor, which is, you know, 95 plus percent of us in that I'll admit it was heartbreaking. It was important, but I feel like, like a weight has been lifted off my shoulder personally uh, in that I forgive myself and, and, and I'm ready to move on. And, and so this, this reunion, I think, was, was cathartic in that way too. So thanks for bringing us together, David. Oh, thank you guys. And thank you all. Spencer, his computer died because that's Spencer. He's back. Spencer, you're up. Final words about Cagayan and about this reunion, please. Uh, well, first of all, I don't know what you mean. That's Spencer. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> final words. So, uh, yeah, sorry about that, y'all. But uh, I, I feel like really similarly to what Jatia said, I'd probably missed a few things that a few others of you said since then. But um, we all like gave our all to Survivor. We went in there and like we didn't know if we were going to have three days, six days, whatever. Um, but like the bond you can form in that short of a time is real. And also like the cookie crumbles differently every time. So going back and then like, you know, leaving Kageyan with the perspective that Cass is just the worst and evil and such an idiot. And then going through Cambodia and like living the Cass experience and gaining empathy uh, for what it's like to be rejected by a cast or for what it's like to go through a lot of those things. Like I just have a lot of compassion for everyone who does this experience, whether it's the pain of that or the pain of going out early, the pain of like being embarrassed about how you were on the show. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. My heart goes out to all of you. Like we're always connected and uh, I love you. That's it. Wow. That so, beautiful uh, words. Yes. I have a quick plug. So, um, just talking about portrayals and how we come off on Survivor, I am um, putting together a panel of Black uh, Survivor players because we are really trying to address how people of color and women and uh, people who are just different from the mainstream are portrayed uh, on Survivor. So that is on Friday, this Friday, and we'll be live streaming it. You can go to my Twitter at Jatia PhD or my Instagram for more details. It's called Tribes and Tribulations. Um, and we have a petition started that we're trying to get more people of color um, and diversity behind the camera and in uh, positions that make uh, decisions at CBS to change that. So thank you for letting me plug that. I love you all. Uh, Garrett, I'm glad to hear that you are forgiving yourself. I think you've been harder on yourself than anybody else because I think we all really love you. So you were a great player. That's just how it works. And we are all awesome. Thank you, David, for this opportunity. Sorry, I won't butt it anymore. No, Jatia, you're Jatia. And I love you guys. And I'm honored. And I, I've thought about all the experiences I've had. And I'm a bit older. And I, I've, like Garrett, have been very lucky and very privileged and have been very successful at things I've done. And being on Survivor, forget the humbling part of it. What I love is the connection part. And I didn't think there was a chance after three days that there'd be a connection that would last longer than three minutes. And here we are almost seven years later. And obviously there's issues that come up. And when there's communication, this is part of what's going on in the world right now, that there's conversation starting, there's communication happening. And I'm appreciative that you're all part of my narrative and part of my character arc as a man, as a person, and as a friend. And I'm honored that you guys would come together for nothing personal. And I promise you all one thing, and I will deliver this, that we will never lose touch. And we can all count on each other in a way that you can't count on each other on that island when there's agenda and money involved. But now in the real world, I want you all to know that it, at the end of every day, just know this Brains Tribe is forever, forever connected. And I love you all. Thank you so much for being on the show with me.
Thanks for having us. Thank you. Well Thanks, said, guys. everybody. Wait, David, the one last question. Would everybody play again? <laughs> and would, so, we, would we form Luzon again? Oh, <laughs> uh, no, please no. No. <laughs> I'm too old. I think no I'm to old. all the above for me. <laughs> I no, think if no, I could no. guarantee to be with Garrett, that, that so we could have redemption as a, two, as a group of two people who could have played longer, and if I could have the ability to possibly uh, blindside Spencer, that would be obviously great redemption. No, I'm just kidding, Spencer. <laughs> I would love us all to get together and play again. But on the other hand, I think about the fact that the experience we had is so, how does it get better while we didn't win? How does it get better than that moment when you get on the helicopter and get on the yeah. pad? I mean, that sort of experience that we all have, I'm not sure it can be beaten. Yeah, that's such a great point, David. That moment on the helicopter will forever be one of the most important moments in my entire life. And when I think about my survivor experience today, that's where I go to, that moment right there. Thank you, guys. Be well, be safe, and be happy, and we will talk again soon. Love you guys. Thank you.